What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Property Hustler Show. My name is Andrew, and today Ping and I have Bryce Kaminsky, and he is the host of the Property Profits Podcast. He is an acquisitions and wholesale specialist who has been performing in Canada and the U.S. for several years now. has a lot of great experiences and stories to share with us. We're going to dig into wholesaling, acquisitions, marketing strategies, conversations that you'll need to have in order to make these acquisitions happen. So, Bryce, great to have you on the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me. How would you describe your overall experience in acquisitions and wholesale type real estate, whether it's in Canada or the US? Like, How would you describe your experience? I think one of the big things is they're often approaching the, the business for themselves. They're like, I want this and I want that and I want this. And those people don't do very well. Like, You can't do a transaction unless you understand why it's transacting, especially with marketing pieces. All day, people come to me, they say, what do you think this marketing piece? And I'm like, it's talking about everything you want. Not one message on here has anything to do with like why they would want to call you. Like you're not talking to your customers. And, and I think that's why people dart and they send out a bunch of marketing and then they end up like quitting because their focus was like what they want. And you'll get what you want when you start to explore and get curious about why they want to sell, why the house is like this, why they haven't brought a realtor in, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you figure those things out, you can start to understand you as a wholesaler is actually the answer to the problem because you're able to do things that the average realtor just can't do for people. That's the only reason we're in business. What was the biggest reason that you see that sellers are sell offloading their properties are off market? I think historically, I would say that they don't want people to see how they're living. They want a quiet, private transaction. They're willing to give up equity for a service. Like, I don't want anyone to see all of this the way I was living. So they don't want it to go on MLS. They don't want the pictures up. They don't want the neighbors seeing the inside of the house. You know, they don't want the sign. They don't want the nuisance. And I think that's one of the big reasons. The other one is just like speed and, and the ability, like typically we're a lot firmer when we're making offers or like 30 days, you know, cash, pretty much no financing. So people like that transaction, but I think it's really one of the core, I would say like 60, 70% is just like, they don't want the show coming through everyone, like the neighbors coming through and ch checking the house out, looking at the pictures. Cause they're just, you know, they've been in there for 30 years and the stuff's piling up. Yeah. I think you're touching on what some people will translate to is some kind of a convenience and problem solving. Right. So this is why when a lot of people will look at properties, I think even if you're just pulling properties up on Google Maps, you're doing some kind of driving for dollars, you look at some kind of distress and neglect. It kind of tells you right from the get go that whoever owns this property either doesn't want to deal with it, can't deal with it, is incapable of some things there. They know that if they go to a realtor, a realtor's going to say, well, listen, you really ought to cut the grass, you know, maybe take these things off of the windows or you see that property's boarded up. Right. So. If you're able to offer a solution there, that will probably be what you're looking for. But you mentioned, you know, putting out marketing material. What's your view on putting out marketing material costs money? It's paid. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who want to get into, let's just say, wholesale or acquisitions end up looking at it from the, hey, this is like an easy buck to make. I don't need a lot of money to get started. But that requires a lot more manual outreach. Mm -hmm. How would you compare that from the manual outreach to paid? I think they can all work. You know, a lot of times when I'm doing training, like I do a training on acquisitions like pure acquisitions, no capital raising, none of that stuff. And so people come in at all varying incomes. So they'll be like, I'm brand new and I'm strapped. I have no cash. And then there's no cash strategies. Like I got to get started and I have no cash strategies. Then there's people like in jobs, maybe you're trying to like step out of their uh, W2 or their T4 job, start getting leads, but they, they don't have the time because it's always time or money. And I, I remember when Andrew Tate said this and it really hit, it was like money is a store of other people's time. And then as soon as I was like, okay, so there's nothing but the transaction of time. Either you're cooking dinner with your time or you're buying dinner with your time you spent it over here and you got an exchange. When I started thinking about that, it was all about, okay, if all money is time and all time is money interchangeably, how can we make sure that we're doing the highest leverage thing? So when you're working at a job, if you're making $105 an hour, let's say when it breaks down your salary and you can hire a cleaner for $20, you can offload these things that you need done. So it really comes down to time or money, which one you have more of. And if you have no money and you're spending your time door knocking, manually flyering, you know, buying up 
pad of paper and a Sharpie is like under $10, $20, and you're just out there using your time and your money. But you could also hire someone to do that. So what I'm seeing right now is a lot of people navigating to the pay-per-click. I see it working for people, especially in Ontario, because there's so many like micro markets. You could do a deal out here and, you know, somewhere between London and, and Hamilton, and there's five little towns and someone's doing a deal on an old fourplex or something because it came through the pay-per-click. But when you look at a place like Winnipeg or Edmonton, these are like hub, you know, outside of Winnipeg is just field. If I get a lead outside of Winnipeg, I'm like, no, thank you. Because there's no buyers out there. Maybe Brandon, but the second largest city in Manitoba is only like 200,000 people. So when all the population is in one place, you get a lot of the same echo. There's no like uniqueness when it comes to these online strategies because everyone's running the same ad. Everyone's running the same demographics. So they're getting the same lead. So the same thing comes in. Five people who are all doing pay-per-click are all exercising the same lead. So it's almost becoming like a private MLS. I don't really like that because you're ending up battling with people on the same things. I remember when I started in real estate, it was all about lists. My my mentor, Stefan Arnio, he said, when your business is all said and done in real estate, it's worth nothing but the lists you made. Like none of the things that we really carry beyond the lists that we hold on good realtors to call, good money partners to call, properties that are on distressed lists. Like that's all worth something to say if I was to sell my company. But because it's active flipping and wholesaling, it burns out that list two or three years later is worthless. So all you have is to generate the list. So I like to generate lists and I like to work a little bit harder. The harder it is to get to the thing, the less people are there, right? By the way, I- For market strategies like that. I think that will resonate with a lot of people. Well, actually they'll resonate with a lot of people who understand this. I feel like a lot of people who will get into wholesale, one of the reasons why I see a lot of people quit is because of that hard work aspect. That Because especially when you're starting off with no money, actually I shouldn't even say that. Even if you're starting out with money, it's hard because you start to see that money kind of burn in your experimenting process, right? That can be stressful and people are quick to give up. But the truth is you kind of have to find your groove. So let's talk about lists a little bit, right? Obviously, one of the biggest difference that a lot of people talk about, the difference between wholesaling in Canada versus wholesaling in the US really comes down to data. Oh, yeah. Availability of data is huge over there. And now you have to know, like, because there's an availability of data, it means that there's industries built around data and you have to start to become familiar with what are your industry standards. Like if you're calling people, you know, what should you do? Should you go buy a list, call people on the list, you know, people who are homeowners? Should you build your own list? And like, should you go around knocking on doors? Like people have a lot of questions. And especially, you know, people who are operating in the Canadian market, going to operate in an American market where things are vastly different, not just regular laws. We're talking about neighborhood discrepancies, disparity yeah. between, you know, you have one property on one street uh, that's worth $180,000 and then you have property on the next street over is like 40 or right. five. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, yeah, it's right? Like block by block. I, you know, I can remember it when driving in Cleveland, we we'd be looking at these houses just east, you know, in these forest addresses that are, they're named after like ABC in some way. And I wouldn't even feel safe driving down the street. And then on the next street over, it's like brand new asphalt. Everyone's house is nice, and it's literally back to back with the neighborhood that I wouldn't even want to drive down. So I was actually talking about this with American who does wholesaling, and I also do some wholesaling in Florida, and we do. Lists, all list, list, lists, right? They're like, oh, where can we get the list? One of the most powerful things is that Americans can buy lists like crazy. They can just, you can just buy a list and start calling. And just like everyone can buy that list and everyone can get on that list. So one of the guys that I know who does list deep dives. So if you're in America, you've got to do something different. Just like in Canada, you have to do something different to get the phone to ring. In the United States, you have to do something different to make sure that your list is good. And so what he does is go goes property first, then list. People in the States are going list, then property. They're like, okay, generate the list. Let's look at the properties. Okay, these are worthwhile. But in reverse, I said this to the guy, he worked in Dallas, this guy, Aaron. And I said, just pause for a second and imagine you have no lists, Aaron. And he's like, I guess I'd have to start flyering houses and stuff. I'm like, exactly. And it's so easy for an American to just sit there on their computer and pull up their list. I'll just get a new list. I'll just buy a new list and I'll just mail some more stuff. You and everybody else. You know, it's the same thing. Like if every guy in the bar is dressed in the exact same gap outfit or air apostle, like the girl's not going to care. Like you got to do a little thing that's different. And there was this quote came up and it said, and you probably heard this time and time again, it says, good artists imitate, great artists steal. I thought about it for a second and I said, okay, it sounds cool. It's like everyone says that it's like cool thing. But when you look at your marketing, you say good artists imitate. So if you just go 
line for line on your marketing change to your name, it'll be good. And I suggest that if you're starting, like every musician, don't start writing music right away. Just copy and cover. Get good at playing music. Get good at handling phone calls. Copy the guy's thing one to one. When you look at the next line, it says great artists steal. And the part of stealing that's really interesting is that you take ownership of it. You're like, this is mine now. And you might, you know, paint the bike. Like, let's say you stole a bike. You're like, this is mine now and you paint it red. It's different now. So when you look at your marketing, good artists imitate, great artists steal. So you go and you actually tweak it just a little bit. Don't get crazy by changing a bunch of stuff, but be a little bit different and start testing that. You know, one of my greatest marketing pieces came from a complete accident. I went to the wrong address, dyslexic. I said 634. It was 643. I wrote this letter. Lady called me like 15 minutes later. I'm like, what? How did I get an instantaneous response from, from my seller? Actually, Actually, not even the seller. I was at the wrong house. So she calls me right away. I grab my pad and my paper and I use the, you remember in school, you could like take a pencil and figure out what you wrote because it was just a one-off letter. And then I took that marketing mistake and I ran with it. I ran it out all the way and, you know, we did it for years and I still do it to this day. And it's just different than the, hey, I, I want to buy your house. Call me. I'm a cash buyer. I buy, I'm an investor. I've bought 24 in the neighborhood. I close fast and all these things that I do and like big deal. Like what about, you know, back to what I was saying before, what about what they want? I think if people think about it, like we buy problems instead of we buy houses, you'd have a better approach to the entire business. Sorry, Bryce, I got two questions here. So number one, you wrote the wrong address and then it piques the interested seller or the homeowner reach out to you right away. Right away. That's a, what is this about? Yeah. And I was like, how did that work so good? I eventually went back to the, the actual address, did the meeting with the old man and not, there's nothing there. But later that afternoon, we photocopied that message and ran it out. We went out into the field and I got 40% callback on that. We dropped a hundred and I got 40 phone calls that afternoon. Was it just a standard marketing material that you just wrote the wrong address on? No, it was just like a human nature message. It was just like, a, hey, I missed you. I, I was in the neighborhood type thing. It triggered the phone call. Because I think, you know, people are really worried about filtering their leads. You know, that's one thing that we eventually did was we added a few more things onto the message to kind of delimit the whole thing because I was burning through my minutes every day. I'd get my burner phone, I'd put the minutes on it, I'd get like 200 minutes and we would deploy like 200 pieces and I'd be on the phone from seven until like nine o'clock. And every day I was burning through like 50 minutes. I was like, okay, $50 worth of minutes. I got to like figure out how to like not get everyone in the neighborhood calling me. So we tweaked it a little bit and the thing is super simple. For the sake of it, I'll give it to everyone because here's the difference. You got to go out there and deliver it. So it says, hey, it's Larry. I was here at some time, urgency stamp. I was here. I I was actually here at two o'clock. I want to buy your house. I'll pop by later this afternoon. Call me, Larry. That's it. And it's very simple, but there's something, there's two things on that that are triggering people to call you. And I would love to run this out in the States. I bet it would blow up. <laughs> like they don't, they, they don't even do it. Like people don't even fly in the States. The timestamp is big that you were here. And then the message that I'm coming back later gets people to call. I don't want them to come back later. So a little message like that. And I would come back later and I'd, you know, knock on the door again. Hey, I want to talk to you about your house. And that has nothing to do with who I am, has nothing to do with what I do, has nothing to do with cash now, fast, later, whatever. It's just human nature. Hey, I was here and I would have to be because it's not stamped. It's it's not irregularly folded. It's a human nature place because the closer you can get to human nature, the more you're going to get an actual interaction. You know, I always found with the pay-per-click that you'd get the worst leads. Like just the absolute, I hate it. It's just like people who are tired of their realtor and still want too much money. Like what a waste of my ad spend to, to have that person call me. Because I'm advertising to everyone. I might as well be like McDonald's, like 99 cent burgers. Everyone call me, right? And that's why I don't really go into the whole pay-per-click ad spend type thing. Terrible leads. I've only really had like one or two all time that were worthwhile. Yeah. By the way, canvassing is, it has been proven to be effective in different types of environments, different climates, and also in different areas, right? Some are more popular. And like, I know you're saying that they, they probably don't do this in certain parts of the States. But I know that, like, you know, depending on the neighborhood you're in, in Ontario, tons of properties get these things all the time, like the door hangers, the, the folded messages, the handwritten, and they all say different things. I think people just start to automatically pick up. Like, it's hard. I, I was looking through the mail the other day, just an example, and the only one I actually paid attention to was there was a postcard. Because it was a postcard, I checked it, right? Mm -hmm. But some of them, they're like folded letters. I don't even really look at them. Just kind of toss might, them out. You might if it looked like this. Well, 
Wow. I like it. That's, that's amazing. That's all they could see. That, that's it. In my message, like as you saw, there's an inherent urgency in the writing. That's a photocopy. I write it once. I photocopy the the human speed. I'm like, hey, I'm in a hurry. I was here. I got to go. And I'll write it like that instead of that. Hi. Yeah. My name is Andrew. Yeah. All like nice, like as if you got the stencil out of your grade six projecting pro projector kit and you're like. Yeah. By the way, you know what? Actually, just to brainstorm something here, because that's actually a very good point and I haven't thought about this before, but like, okay, uh, what people will do is they'll write out these handwritten letters, photocopy them all. You can still tell that they're photocopied and they're also kind of written with a little bit too much intention and purpose. But I know sometimes if like, uh, it, like my, my contractor or something would like tape something to the door or it's like uh, a notice or something where it's just written hand like you're going to give this a little bit more it will matter more to you and sometimes the whole thing about you sending it to the wrong address is that somebody might call you back and be like hey what's this about it is in fact bearing the lead and sometimes you can have a friendly conversation with be like oh yeah no aren't you so and so and like we had arranged this and be like no i didn't be all like what are you sure hold on and then be like oh my bad i messed it up you kind of have a nice conversation at that point and now you're in a position to be all like okay well listen for whatever it's worth now that i have you on the phone <laughs> you've already had a chuckle together people are more receptive so well, it's interesting you say that because every year about this time i'll do my marketing piece and then someone will take my phone number and post me as a free camper on kijiji They'll say free camper and my phone number and my phone will just start ringing because people want this free camper like RV. The first couple of years, I would be like, haha, it's a prank. And I'd be kind of pissed off. But this year when it happened, I just, I was like, okay, I can't stop the phone from ringing because people want this camper. But at least I can say it's a prank. It's because I buy houses. If you know someone and I turned those things, I turned it into lead generation. Like, haha, joke's on you guys. I'm actually this year going to use it to like actually uh, have some conversations. And I actually did get a couple of leads from these people. They're like, oh yeah, oh, that sucks that that was a that they pranked you like that but i do actually know of a property that that might be for sale I'm like cool let me know so it's all about getting the phone to ring however you you can get that human conversation that's what i really focus on you know i did this we keep every flyer we get we're in a flyering zone so i keep all of the marketing swipe file i'm sure you guys have a swipe file for marketing pieces but we keep every single piece of marketing that we get and i went through and i did we were doing a webinar you know the the training session and i went through every single one being like, this is why it doesn't work. This is why it doesn't work. The overlying theme was people are putting messages in their marketing that has people saying, no, it's not me. So it's not for me. The more you put into your letter, the more opportunities you have to obviously, you know, filter the list. But why do you want to filter your phone calls? Wouldn't you rather do that on the phone? Because what someone thinks and what someone is, you know, it's not worth the time, especially if you're doing, let's say you're doing a Canada Post campaign, right? You want to like blast a total zip codes. Don't put so much stuff on there that you're alienating potential sellers. Just let people know that you're here to help. You're here to do business. You're in business, but don't be like putting all these things about you on it and, and try to limit the characters. Like think about Twitter, 180 characters or whatever it is. And don't write this. Do that on the phone. Write this. Just a little bit. Bread over a large thing so the old lady who's like 90 can actually read your writing. Like so many people have these like tiny little things and like who are you actually mailing this to like the person that's got the equity to sell to you might be 65 plus let's say they are they're trying to do their downsizing they're maybe dealing with their brother sister's estate their parents estate 95 year old dies you know like i'm 40 now and i have to wear glasses and if you think that someone in their 60s can read an iphone screen no you, they've got it on accessibility mode and there's like five letters on the whole cell phone watch your customer like we're not doing enough you don't know your customer well enough if your marketing isn't working you haven't investigated the customer like i used to go to bridge manitoba do you guys know what bridge is the card game no so it's a game where old old people like to play what's called bridge oh. arts yeah 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 so the four of them they sit across and there's two teams and they play bridge against each other. We were working on a contract with Bridge Manitoba to supply all of their playing cards. And on the back of all the cards says, we buy houses. Because 
this club has an obituary section on their website. Like that's where we are. And when you look at death, downsizing, divorce, we're not thinking we're better than what's already been time and memorial. That's what moves real estate. People who outgrow their houses, people who pass away, and people who have to split the assets when it comes to divorce. There's nothing really new. I think the newest one in, in the last 20 years is debt, D-E-B-T. That's the fourth D in that debt downsizing death and divorce but like don't pretend like you can reinvent the human nature of real estate so i can't remember who said it but it was a lot of people are going right at their target but in marketing especially if you're doing your pay-per-click and stuff like that you want to be at angles to the thing you don't want to be coming directly at it. So instead of advertising for We Buy Houses, why wouldn't you advertise in the categories for like moving services? So your ad seems to pop up miscategorized. Like, oh, what a coincidence. My We Buy Houses ad is showing up next to the divorce stuff. But they're not. They're like going right at the houses and your ad spend is playing against real estate agents. You think you're going to outspend a real estate agent in Ontario? Like, are you kidding? Yeah. You know, he's pulling up in the G-Wagon and you think your ad spend is going to get the lead first? Like, I don't think so, man. So you got to find, there's a book, it's called uh, Blue Oceans, Blue Ocean, Red Ocean, right? And my realtor's always talking about it. So anytime we're feeling like a gridlock, we're like, okay, we need to like find blue oceans. Because everything in real estate seems to cycle, especially with marketing. You look at, and I remember Stefan said this back in the day, he said, real estate in Canada, we're 10 years behind. So we can import technology and import strategies and be 10 years ahead. What are we doing in the States right now that Canadians aren't doing? Well, we're aggressively hunting foreclosure. Now, they've got a little bit of a different foreclosure market being that there's a lot less safety nets, like people fall through the bottom of their society all the time. That's capitalism, part of one of the reasons I love it, but they're so much more aggressive. Like you talk to someone in Canada who's doing foreclosure hunting and they're like, yeah, I went and knocked on the door. One strategy. Okay, cool. What about the other six ways Americans are trying to get at that person? What about the person in the United States who pulls the list, finds out that the numbers are no good, finds the property that has high equity, skip traces, and uses a process server to find the relatives to try to find the person? When you gauge the pursuit of the American wholesaler and the Canadian wholesaler, it's not even it's not even the same. We're we're in like the dark ages. That's why bandit signs work ten years after it did in the States, because it's just worse we're in that echo of whatever they're doing. So I always say to people, like if you want to find a good We Buy Houses ad for Kijiji or Craigslist, go to a hot market like Atlanta, copy it word for word and imitate until you can figure out why it's working to duplicate the process, add your own spin to it. Find that blue ocean. I got actually a couple questions here so number one you said what's the metrics that you're looking at right now so for marketing we always look at the ROAS right return on the estimate or that's the cost per acquisition do you have a metric that you're always kind of monitoring to make sure that if it's not working as effectively you need to start adapting to a new strategy What's that number? The main thing that I'm always focused on is the number of calls per, like your conversion ratio, calls per piece. You never know which one of those metrics is going to actually have that deeply discounted deal. It could be your first flyer. It could be your 5,000th flyer. It's always about the number of like actions that are happening. If you're not getting an action return, like you put out a hundred and you get one call, that's not a piece worth running on mass. If you put out a hundred, you get 10 calls. That's a piece that's worth running on mass. If you can, the strategy works. So when you're looking at it, if it's 5% or lower, you need to do something different because there's better strategies. We only have so much time and, and energy. And so if you're like door hangers, when people say, oh, I'm doing door hangers, I'm like, oh no, that's like a point zero five. Like it's not even 1% return. So you better be doing like 10,000. The one the one thing that I will say is that when I go into these We Buy Houses properties, the people who need our services keep all the letters, but I've never seen them keep a door hanger. So the people running door hangers, I don't know, it's just not, not my style. I never had any luck with them. And like if you're a painting company or something like that, a service-based company, I think those work. It's not very human to leave a door hanger, you know? It, well, it might as well be... Uh, it's very corporate. Yeah. Some people do. I've seen some people in the States use post-it notes now. So they get a stamp that says, hey, I'm so-and-so, I want to buy your house. They stamp them and then they just stick them on the doors and then people come back and maybe they get a little pissed because there's like a little bit of glue on their door or whatever. If you're in marketing for houses and someone's upset with your marketing piece, don't listen to them. They are not your customer, okay? Don't change what you're doing because someone's pissed off with your marketing. 
they're not your customer. I just want people to hear that piece because students of mine will say, oh, someone said I shouldn't do that. And I said like, yeah, but are they selling, you know, like, are they in, even in your business? Like, don't listen to that. Like, it's not, it's not going to change the, the way it goes. Okay. So the conversion is about 5%. And by the way, outdoor hangers is not even doing 1%, like not even, not even point five. Historically, not even. Our cost per, per acquisition, per deal on the country. Over 3,000? No, seven to 8,000. So well, that, that could be in Ontario. probably a percent, it's probably a percentage against your price point, right? Because mm-hmm. if you look at it in Winnipeg, it might be two or 3,000 to acquire something that'll make you like 20 or 30,000. So if you spend seven or 8,000 to market and get a deal in Ontario, it's probably going to make you seven. 70 or 80,000. So there's probably a metric there that measured over all provinces is probably like you're spending about 10% to acquire. And that's a great return. You know, if you can get a three to one return, people are happy. If you're getting a 10X on your money, then why wouldn't you just do that all year? And that's what, essentially what we did back in the day when I started with Stefan is he was in the coaching side of things and I was on the acquisition side. And so we had a marketing thing and we say every deal is making us like 20 or 30 grand. So it costs us about 10% to market to that audience. So how many flyers, how many minutes walking, and it would usually end up being about, yeah, deal in, in two grand or so. Yeah, that's why like people are saying that a wholesale business is kind of like a marketing business, right? You mm-hmm. market out your flow, obviously you're not really doing the real estate deals, you're just transacting the paperwork. That's that's very interesting. Now, the second question I have is, how do you usually navigate this type of conversation when there's an inbound call comes from? A lot of our members in our community are concerned about having that conversation, because sometimes that people go, yeah, Explain the, how, how the conversation flows. The first thing I would always say is never answer with your name. And you always want to have way more energy. So the first time when my phone rings and people are calling me up, it's like I've done a marketing campaign, I'm getting inbound. I just, with the big hello, like almost like a cartoon. You want to change the frame on people. If you answer hello, uh, uh, hello, you're kind of getting beat. So you want to open with tons of energy. And this is a really key mindset piece. We did everything in our entire life this week to get this phone to ring. Do not hang up the phone. You paid blood, sweat, and tears and money. Let them hang up. So never hang up the line. You know, they're going to get upset and it might, it might get into like a little bit of a wrestle. And most people will be like, okay, bye. And they hang up. You paid good money for that phone to be on. Let them hang up. And they're like, okay, bye. And you're like, okay. And they're like, are you going to hang up? No, go ahead and hang up. Like it'll get to that positioning. And that will give you more time if you remember that you're not hanging up. And so I have a very generic script. You know, you got my letter and you said, yeah, I was in the neighborhood. I was looking to buy a couple properties. I sent you that letter to see if you had any interest in pause. I don't know. I don't know. Selling that house. So there's a lot of softeners in there. They're always like, what's this all about? Right. The number one question is like, I got your thing. What's this all about? And you said, well, I was in the neighborhood looking at a couple properties. Yours isn't the only one. And I was wondering, softener, if you ever thought, not are certain, if you ever thought about, I don't know, softener, maybe softener, I don't know, selling that house. And I will soften that thing up like crazy so that I'll do a maybe ladder. So a maybe ladder is like, okay, like 0%, 1%, 10%, like you're 20%. And I'll just keep going until they stop. It's, oh, so you're about 50%. Maybe you would maybe you wouldn't and they still haven't said anything oh you're about 60 percent, maybe 80 percent. like you're 100 percent. you want to sell this thing and then they'll be like no 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 i'm i'm like closer to like 50 50 and that'll break the situation more wide you know and the other thing you got to remember everyone is that they called you there is something there you must uncover it recently in the last couple of years i don't know if you guys know what nepq is jeremy minor He's a sales trainer. Absolutely blew my mind on how to navigate conversations. There's someone said this on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. And the guy says, it's better to be interested than interesting. So when people call you, you're always trying to be interesting. You're trying to like prove that you're the guy to, to buy this house. Be interested, you know, and ask more questions. Like whatever they say, and you can, and this is probably something every one of your students can use because it's super easy. No matter what anyone says, like say any, just any, throw any objection to me, any, either of you guys, give me any sort of thing that like most people would be like in, up in a corner. You mean like the, in the first conversation? Yeah. And just give me anything. Uh, usually it's a three, three, four things, right? And uh, we will consider if the price is right. Right. So that's a sort of financial objection. Sometimes it's false. I need to talk. To yeah. So, so the price is important to you then. Echo, just mirror the po- the point, the price as a question mark, whatever they say, this marketing has got me upset, upset. You don't have to know anything. You can be ready 
with whatever, with just, it's almost like a jujitsu move. It's just a reversal. Whatever they say, it comes back to them as a question mark. Too, too loud, annoyed. And then that'll get them to start talking. Yeah, you know, I got that thing and I, I've been working on my house on the inside. It just looks like crap on the outside. Oh yeah. And here's the second one. Why is that though? That will peel the onion. This is NAPQ where you keep going down because there's, it's always two truths and a lie. So true, true, true lie. And there's always an onion to peel when these people call you because they're usually like, they're on defense. From from you until you peel it back and you're able to actually find out like what's the problem here why are you actually calling me you're pacing it uh, for each objection then try to isolate that and ask the leading questions to get them to really are you like why what that is so in yeah, and you can just keep going back and forth between the mirror and why is that though i feel that a lot of the cause even before they get to any receptiveness like oh yeah if it's about price because a lot of people aren't even to get to the point of the conversation where they're even receptive to the idea of speaking to you right so let's just say if they're calling you in this situation we're still on ad spend right so we're spending some kind of money or effort or energy to canvas to get some people to call so it's just like some kind of like you're peacocking or you're basically bringing people in i have found that people often call because of sometimes curiosity but then oftentimes confusion mm -hmm. like why did this come to me right like they don't quite understand like uh, why you sent this to me right and then they'll have some kind of confusion and objection handling like that. Because if you just straight up, oh, well, I'm interested. Yeah, it's always fine. the same. It's always the same. What's this about? Like people think that they get a ton of objections. I would always draw a pyramid. It always comes in in like a filter to the left is half your calls that you can't deal with. To the right is half the calls that are actually have equity and half of half we can do something. Half of them, you know, don't quite have a house that we need, but then the half of the half, so about 25% of all calls over time is all that we're really like, we're filtering that. So if you have a good marketing piece, you should be throwing about half of your stuff, not out guys, to your real estate agent. Like people do not monetize their garbage leads. They just like, it's not a lead for me. Recycle. Like there's, yeah, you got to be able to, you can get some of your ad spend back. Like early on, we would sell those names and phone numbers for I think a hundred dollars a pop. And then the realtors would take their hand and turn at it. Cause in Canada, we don't have any lists, right? So we were essentially generating a list by marketing for, you know, driving for dollars or whatever, but every single lead that comes in through my phone and any sort of thing they're like they're typically like what's this about or what can you do for me and i don't even play into that it's always it might as well be an ai or a recording i'm just like oh, i was in the neighborhood i wouldn't have been sending that letter or interested in your property if i wasn't i was in the neighborhood looking at a couple properties saw your house figured i'd drop you a letter figured i'd send you a postcard figured i'd post it uh advertise in your neighborhood whatever your strategy is because i'm i'm thinking you know wondering if you'd ever thought about I don't know, maybe selling that house. And they're like, no. And you say, why is that though? Well, I want to live here forever. Oh yeah, I live here forever. And it just pulls people apart. You know, if you really want to like, you really want to play the game, go watch Jeremy Miner's Reels. He does tons of free training. If you're serious about it, actually take his training. They have real estate scripts for doing uh, cold calling and stuff. And he he's a ninja. Like it blew my mind. It changed the way I did sales completely. That was 2022. Changed our marketing pieces, changed my inbound phone calls, increased my conversion. And the other thing it did is it turned a lot of those things that I would have thrown out, you know, where they're like kind of mean or they're like contentious. It allowed me to diffuse a lot of those because I wasn't talking, they were, you know, if you're talking, you're losing in a negotiation, they should be talking. Cause when you're talking, and this is another Stefan said this to me way back in the day about negotiation was people can listen about two or three times faster than you can possibly talk. So if you're talking, they're processing and they're negotiating, they're listening. So if they're talking and you're listening and absorbing and you're actually in in the power position when you're listening not talking so by the way i just recognize uh, uh who he is uh i actually wasn't aware of his last name but yeah he's he's all over my instagram he's a, that that a program beast. that nepq program changed sales for me and really helps me in in dealing with problems because it's really about problem awareness and figuring out like one of the main lines is like i don't even know if i can help you like taking it off the table they're like what's this all about and you say i don't know what is this about well i got your i got your letter here in my hands oh yeah and so how can i help you well what's this all about i buy houses i don't even know if i can help you and just keep taking it away from them tell me more about why you called me and now it's on them to qualify for your service instead of you to qualify for their service it's very interesting the human nature that program not exploits but understands i would use that word instead understanding the human nature of things i think this is all like 
particularly good, especially for people who are able to, you know, put something out there, especially for those who are able to spend a little bit of money. People are going to have questions about Pipita and all this other stuff, selling people's personal information, right? But like, if you have a number and you give a number to somebody as a, as a reference or referral, that's valuable to a lot of people. But now let's talk about the U.S. When people want to get into wholesaling, you can literally go into Google Maps, drop down, find an address, look at a house that looks a stress, and you can go into plug it into tools. So if we touch a little quickly on tools, tell me if you use any of these tools or you're familiar with any of them, but like tools like Deal Machine. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. In Cleveland, that was the best. I'd, I'd literally be standing in front of a house. I'd take a picture. It would tell me the whole the county information and give me their thing and then there'd be a call button and you just call the owner and I'd be talking to owners immediately as if I'm driving down the street so like it's amazing in states where they do have that availability some states still do have some privacy but still it's not the same as Canada we have nothing yeah exactly so you're able to use tools like that and you don't even have to literally be driving now you can go into Google Maps you can look at the addresses pull them up find a building that's boarded up but what I think a lot of Canadians struggle with the differences is like one understanding neighborhoods that's challenging over there. But two, understanding the market that we may not be so comfortable with. Like as Canadians, maybe we want to stick to B-class neighborhoods. But then you see a lot of American wholesalers who are aggressive, who are hungry. And even a lot of American real estate investors, they're picking up properties that are $40,000 in like high crime, low income areas. And they're selling them to other investors. And Somebody's got to own it. Somebody's got to own it, right? And a deal is still a deal. But the question is, you know, this is something that Canadians might struggle with in terms of adjusting their mindset to that. Do they want to even be dealing with that? I is this can. Yeah, definitely. Go on. I want to hear the rest. Of the thing. Yeah. And so if you go and buy a list, I feel that's one of the things that this is, again, what I've gathered too. When you buy these lists, other people are buying these lists. And there's a lot of people who are more, let's just say, enterprise wholesalers. Enterprise wholesalers, and they have like VAs, they have trained people who are making their calls. Somebody might have done it for a while to create a script yeah. to get all these other people to go and make these phone calls for them. So now you have like pros who are calling these lists and they're playing a numbers game. Mm -hmm. So my perspective on is like if you go through a tool like like Deal Machine, go around, find properties that you think you understand, run them through, create your own list. That's your list, right? You're not competing with anybody. And they're, they're, these people are not are probably not getting called as much as like the people on the lists are, mm -hmm. right? In terms of outreach and stuff, like what's your perspective on like, you know, your own list, calling your own leads? Like you said, you did some with Deal Machine versus buying lists. How How's your outreach success or how do you find that the outreach stuff there's a reason that they that they eventually outsource these things to people in like the philippines and stuff it is like the meat grinder of any business i've ever done like the you will dial for hours and talk to no one i literally have the tv on and the dialer just on cycle and i might get one person an hour and that's i'm just like i got my son he's playing he's watching like poppy playtime in the background and I got, I'm on, like, I literally do two markets at the same time. Like the phone will be on cycle dialing and I'm on my cell phone doing the local market here in Winnipeg while that thing cycles. And I would say it's like one possible conversation lead for every 10 hours of dialing. So if you want to play that game, there's a reason that they outsource it to the Philippines because those people will do that. Okay. So question then on that is through your own list creation or by buying lists? Composition of both. So there's list creation that's happening where we're creating our own list, scraping some lists. I think that it's it all comes back to the fact that people can buy the same list. Like how valuable would it be if you had all the water turnoffs in London? If you knew everyone who's getting water turnoffs in the next 30 to 60 days, why is there water turnoff? Well, there's trouble, but you can't get that. Well, maybe Maybe you take up smoking and you stand around the curb at the edge of the water turnoff place and you start talking to people at the water department and maybe you take someone out for lunch and maybe a piece of paper slides across the table and like that's the business of real lists. My mentor Stefan Ardio, he writes, there's a chapter in his books called Insider Trading. And insider trading is against the law in every other business, but in real estate, it's the entire business. Like, tell me someone who got a really great deal on a multifamily property that wasn't greasing something or knew someone or beat the market in a way that you couldn't have done because it's insider trading. And so when you look at your lists that you're generating, 
the lists that you can get in Canada, the states too. You got to do list stacking. You got to say, okay, all these houses are damaged. How many of them are veterans? How many of them are high equity? And out of 4,000 records, you get down to about 40 and you work those people nonstop. Letters in all the angles, knocking on the door, sending out the flyer, sending out the second flyer, sending out the third flyer, calling them, calling them, calling them, texting them, calling them. That's how people make money in the States when they're when they're doing it. They're super aggressive and the systems are super tight. So if you want to import that into Canada, you'll you'll crush everyone. Not even on the same thing. Most wholesalers in Canada dial once and the, the lead's done. They yeah, they, they don't follow up. But which brings me to the next question, by the way, because you said you're using a dialer. Uh, which dialer do you use? I think it's it's called like Business XL something. Mm. It's a, a cover for what sounds like to be like Infusionsoft on some level or something like Keep. So it, it reminds me of the dialer. It's using a back-end service. I think at the end of the day, I like TalkRoute better than any any other one. TalkRoute was my favorite because it had good texting, it had good market number matching. Like you could get a phone number real easy in the market. It has good import. It has good like power dialing. So TalkRoute is probably my, my favorite one to use when I'm dialing out there. Did you ever find any issues when it comes to uh, you using uh, different dialers will, will be able to generate your own numbers, but when you generate those numbers, uh, sometimes uh, people's phone providers will mark it as possible spam or something like or possible scam numbers or something, right? You know, sometimes you, even your our phones will do that now. Like a number comes in, it's like possible whatever. I, th- I don't know what it says. fraud or possible scam or something like that. Yeah, because it's like a generated number. Have you noticed any issues with that? Not really. And it's hard to say, right? Because that would have been the customer seeing it on their end. We don't know that. We just know that they're not picking up. Yeah. I play up the I'm a Canadian thing and I'll dial from my Manitoba number and just give them a th- like spin their head. They're like, oh, why is this guy from Winnipeg, yeah. Manitoba calling... Uh, East Cleveland and like what? What is this? Two o four? What is this? And then mm, I might think of the scam, right? <laughs> if they pick up, I'm those just a Canadian, you know. I'm just figured I'd give you a call, thinking about moving down there, looking for some property. What do you think? You ever thought about? I don't know, maybe selling that thing. Yeah, human nature, really, man. Human yeah. nature. Exactly. Yeah. Stepping back to tools, have you ever tried using something a little bit more manual, like a true people search? I've seen some of that stuff. I've seen one of the guys who works in the states heavy on the list stuff. He does a ton of that true people. And I can't remember the other one that he was using for skip tracing. Essentially he gets like a flat prop rate. Stream. Yeah. Prop stream, but it had a different name. I think it's the one you were saying first people something, but he uh, uses these yeah. different servers to find, I don't know how much like dialing you guys have done into the States, but you'll pull a record from the County and it'll have like three different phone numbers and none of them are good. Like they're all like long gone. So all you really have in the States, usually I would say about 20% of those phone numbers are still kicking around. So now that we understand that you've pulled a hundred and then only 20 of those numbers are real, owner is usually real and the equity is usually real and the address is usually real. So the people who go further and scrape the list and stack it one more time and say, okay, here's all the actual equity let's run it through an actual like dip tracing service for the people and find the real number or find someone in association with that person so friends and family their parents their cousins you know same last name same city call them up you know what are the chances if i call one of your parents by the last name in the phone book and i find someone if i'm really so determined how many kaminskis are in winnipeg if i can call all of them or anyone that's listed you know that's the grind that these americans are doing when we're just like well my facebook adds up time to go watch netflix i'm a canadian <laughs> we should do one of those things i'm a canadian investor of course i don't do follow-ups <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> There is definitely be, uh, a lot to be said about being able to squeeze. And I know that we're saying that Canadians won't do that. I do think that a lot of Americans won't do that either. Because you just mentioned too, like you go through the list. And by the way, like even when we use dollars and we go through some of this stuff, it really goes to show that a lot of people won't answer. What sometimes is a little demoralizing is like when you don't know if like the industry standards vary between like regions um, in terms of how many, how long you need to be calling, how many numbers you need to be hitting in order to have a conversation. And then out of those conversations, how many of those need to be had before one is fruitful. And then on top of that, understanding whether or not this property is even going to have anything worthwhile in it, right? But, you know, most of the time, uh, as long as it was within, it's within the municipality, you should be able to make something work, right? Just hit up the numbers, right? 
but it is definitely a grind. But if you squeeze the list even further, some of the numbers that aren't asking, if you just take the names and run them through another software, I feel like you can definitely like run now. It's like a second filter through the sieve and run now your dialer through the next. Oh, here, here's the flex that this guy does in the States, okay? So now that he's done the, the like you're saying, run it through the dialer, run the person thing, he will go and find them on Facebook and message them. They'll mm -hmm. find the person because people duck their, their text messages, people duck their phone, people might even duck their letters and their mailbox, but oh, message read. He read my message on Messenger and I'm now I'm calling him on Messenger. So people are actually going into the social network to find your at Bryce Kaminsky on Instagram and DM you about your house. So like go further guys, especially in Canada. Like if you can, you know, if you can pull a public record on a property and get a name, that name exists all over. Google it and then suddenly, oh, go on Facebook and punch their name right in at the top. And oh, they're on Facebook. Cause every broke person has Wi-Fi on their old Sony XL phone. And they're on Facebook Messenger and they're sitting in a Tim Hortons and you can get them on the phone, but they have no phone line left. They have no power. They have no heat or water at home. So they're hanging out at the Tim Hortons waiting for someone to buy them a coffee, but their phone is still charged and they're on Facebook. Yeah. So you can find these people, but you got to go the extra mile. And what is the quote? There's not a lot of competition in the extra mile. I love that. And I feel like that's where we can like wrap this up is that honestly, if, if you want to be able to make some money in acquisitions, if you want to be able to make some money in a wholesale, you really, really have to be ruthless. Don't let shame or fear or anything like that hold you back. You just got to go and make things happen. Like actually make things happen i like what you said about saying you you paid for this this is what you've been waiting for don't treat it lightly especially if we're competing with america the thing too is like and i said this to one of my one students and it's like ai doesn't get nervous when it makes calls ai doesn't get nervous when it knocks on doors if it could ai will dial 24 hours a day so put your feelings away and dial and call remove your feelings and be like the ai in a sense like perform the script without your feelings and preconceived knowledge notions and like oh this person's calling me and their tone's a little up and now i'm mirroring and i'm doing all this tone low like ai doesn't care about you just execute and you'll get the result don't bring your feelings into it you can do, deal with your feelings and your trauma from doing real estate after you've made all your money it's a lot easier to deal with your trauma when you're on a pile of money right words of wisdom right there man i appreciate you being on the show i know you gave a lot of golden nuggets a lot of great information so if anybody wants to get in touch with you what's the best way for them to connect just find me on the instagram at Bryce Kaminsky, B R Y C E K A M I N S K Y. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, thank you.